Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Gregory Zeidemann. I'm a PhD student at Penn State University. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you today about a project that I've been working with, uh, with Eric Burkhardt at Penn State, on stocking the hunting grounds and insights into the supply of wild ginseng within Pennsylvania. So before I get started, I just want to quick thank uh, my funding source for this project, which is the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources through their Wild Plant Conservation Fund. Just in case I run right up to my 12 minutes, I wanted to just put a plug in for them as without their support, this project would have been possible. So a little bit about ginseng as a medicine. I suspect most of you are aware of it as it's a, it's a pretty prevalent one within the industry. But it's known broadly as ginsinicides as being the main medical constituent um, or the biologically active compound um, within ginseng. And it's really advocated for virtually every purpose. It's really, really the cure-all um, for all your ailments from cognitive function um, to treating cancer and cardiovascular disease. So a really broad range and um, many people even just take it for general health function on a daily basis. And it's often the root that is traded and consumed however there is a growing amount of interest in consuming other parts of the plant um, for sustainability reasons. So a little bit about the range of American ginseng. It ranges all the way across the East Coast as far south as Georgia and as far west as the Great Plains. And the study that I'm doing is right here in Pennsylvania, um, just for a reference point. <coughs> so to talk about ginseng, you need to really start with the, the culture around the plant here on the East Coast. Um, it's really a tale of exploitation with people searching for and digging out nearly every root they can find. Um, and as you can see in this, in this story from Fur, Fish, and Game, they're talking about finding ginseng where others have already looked. And they, they go as absurd as, okay, if other people go parallel with ridges, you should be going up and down and up and down, and you will find some, and you should take it. So it's, it's really a tragic tale. And the results are that there's still almost 2,000 pounds of dry ginseng root that's exported from Pennsylvania every year. And if this is truly wild ginseng, that would be 300,000 plants um, being dug up every year from the wild for a plant that takes at least five years to reach maturity. So that has resulted in a number of things over, over the years. As far back as 1897, there's a post um, for the Department of Agriculture in Pennsylvania already realizing this, uh, this fact that with exploitation of harvesting in the summertime before the berries are ripe and taking every plant you see is not going to be sustainable in the long run. So already, you know, well over 100 years ago, they were realizing this problem. And as such, in 1975, it was listed in Appendix 2 of CITES, um, requiring a certain amount of regulation and <clears throat> requiring, based on the federal government, for each state to regulate within their own borders how the um, exporting is affecting wild populations. That's resulted in Pennsylvania taking a couple actions to help conserve this species with um, doing this valuable or vulnerable plant license, which is required for anybody that is purchasing ginseng within the state and also putting age restrictions requiring at least five years old before you harvest the plant. So in theory, you're not supposed to be able to sell anything that's younger than that. Um, but it seems to be more of a guideline. So what we can see and what really is driving some of these factors here is the price that you can, you can gain from wild ginseng. You can see the difference of the wild for $800 a, a dry pound, which is driven mostly by Asian markets, which I will come to in a minute, um, versus the cultivated, which is now relatively meager at $55 a dry pound. So Asian markets, where the majority of this wild supply is headed, is ultimately what drives this huge price from our perspective. And you can see here, this was taken um, from a small shop in China where they are selling ginseng. In each of these bins, you can see this 238 in this one. This isn't per pound, but of ounce um, of ginseng root. So people are willing to pay high prices and 
as you can see in the graph, as it's going up in recent years, it's, it's directly correlated with the rise of the, the middle class economy in China. And that's not even the very expensive stuff. That goes upstairs um, where they leave it as artwork. And once again, this picture, the, the most expensive route here in this particular room was for sale for over $200,000. So people are willing to pay great amounts of money um, for this plant, which is something that we can't always understand that well here. So root appearances are extremely important, especially for Chinese markets. They are really interested in what this wild type of uh, ginseng is with a long root neck, and if it has like a more human appearance that is invaluable, um, versus this carrot-like uh, root on the end, which would be the result of cultivation or tilling the land resulting in, in this bigger, straighter root. However, what we can't always tell is the plant husbandry that goes on to result in these roots. There's a lot of ambiguity somewhere in the middle between that left pitcher and the center pitcher. And in terms of trying to determine, is it wild stewarded or is, is it wood cultivated where you know they're actively tilling the land or they're just clearing the, the duff from the soil. So trying to understand how people are interacting with this plant um, to try and sustain it for the long term is something that's been really hard um, to isolate. However, one of the things that we've seen early on that are clear indication that there's a certain amount of husbandry taking place is this, this map of the top 20 counties of export in Pennsylvania. It makes sense that all of these counties over here on the left and up um, would be in the top of that list because that's up on the Allegheny Plateau in Pennsylvania, which is known for low populations and high amounts of wooded area because it's not really high quality tillable land. However, Lehigh County over here um, is a highly agricultural area where it's, it's pretty clear that they must be planting here because there's not the, the vast amounts of forest land that you see in other parts of the state. So there's a number of reasons that people would report wild ginseng when really in actuality they might be having some, um, some amount of husbandry or cultivation taking place. And the first reason is price gouging. When these people purchase uh, ginseng from diggers, even if by all appearances it looks wild, if they know that some amount of cultivation or husbandry is going on, um, they will naturally offer a lower price for the product. Also, theft is a big issue for this crop. It's something that uh, we're really trying to work on in Pennsylvania and the area with education um, for law enforcement. But here's a, a perfect example where this, uh, this grower had called the police over six times over a number of years uh, reporting ginseng theft. And ultimately, it, this one culminated in a sad tale in which he, he killed the thief and is now in prison. Because um, this is a real thing where where police don't necessarily recognize the true value of this crop, and in this case it was his retirement fund. Another reason is tax. This is essentially a cash enterprise in which people enjoy tax breaks by um, keeping it kind of under the table, whereas if it becomes an official enterprise, they will be forced to um, report the sales and pay taxes on it. And lastly, People just aren't that comfortable with the government. Um, a number of them in this industry, um, we work with the DCNR in Pennsylvania, and we get some, some pretty nasty responses back about how we shouldn't be messing with their business in the woods. Um, so they're just not always that interested in, in any type of regulation. So that, that begs the question, how much ginseng husbandry is taking place um, in the sale of wild ginseng? And to get at that, we've used this survey. It's short and sweet, only six questions, um, sent out through DCNR, however, in which we have a code um, so that we're able to actually track the responses. But for all intents and purposes, in terms of regulation, it's confidential in hopes that some of these barriers to reporting um, will be skirted in an attempt to understand what, what people are doing out there. And something that we found is that in total, over 30% of that which was sold into the market um, over the four years we've done this study had some amount of husbandry taking place, whether it was this wild, simulated, or cultivated. We, so we asked this follow-up question. Um, 
how were they doing it? And what we found is that the majority of those that were indeed doing some amount of cultivation was what we would call wild simulated. They were just actively planting seeds back, whether it was purchased seed or seed they collected from the plants they were digging. They were still making some effort to regenerate the next generation of plants. However, another interesting thing that we found was that over 20% of respondents said that they were also purchasing seed. So this has some significant implications in terms of maintaining native uh, genetics within Pennsylvania and the area. As we asked the follow-up question, if they purchased seed, where was it coming from? And we could find that it was all over the place. And the majority was not Pennsylvania. So there's a number of large growers, both in Wisconsin as well as Ontario, which I would say were the most two common responses. But you can see there's a, a large variability in area that these non-native seed sources are entering the state. So I guess to sum it up, ginseng husbandry definitely creates some ambiguity in the wild data that we have um, on ginseng sales within Pennsylvania. However, we believe that this confidential survey has gained us some insight into this, this rather hidden and reserved field, and it could serve as a useful tool in forming conservation and management programs. We're hoping to be able to encourage people to plant, and through DCNR having access to this survey, they would be able to make more informed decisions to encourage that practice. So thank you very much. <laughs>